Hello everyone, how you going? Just going to expand on this mob and who these people are. Um, and who they're connected to. I have several reasons for keeping a half century old gold water for president poster on my wall of my university office. It serves a reminder of my of a youthful pa political passion. I turned 13 the day before Lyndon Johnson crashed the Arizona Senate, Senator at the polls, and it pays tribute to the plain spoken candidate, libertarian and anti-communism. It also, I suppose, offers my own, who would be all of them, who find Goldwater's world, world view, if they know, even more abhorrent than antique. There were things about him not to like. Chief among them, his constitutionally based refusal to vote for the 1964 civil rights. There was also ongoing an attempt in the run-up of the nomination and throughout presidential campaign to thread the needle in a matter of the John Birch Society. Founded in 1958 by a businessman named Robert Welsh, the society was the most robust political fringe group of its day, intent upon thwarting any U.S.-Soviet cooperation, withdrawing America from the United Nations, exposing communists in the federal government, impeach and impeaching Chief Justice Errol Warren, Rick Perlson, and in his 2001 book, Before the Storm, Barry Goldwater and the Unmaking of American Consensus summarizes the timing, the trimming strategy. Goldwater would take the line that Robert Welsh was crazy extremist, but the society itself was full of fine upstanding citizens working hard and well for the cause of Americanism. Throughout the 1964 race, Goldwater availed himself of Bircher money and pan power at the risk of being sold by his opponents to the Birchers. Adel views, the most notorious of them being Welsh's suggestions to that Dwight Eisenhower had consciously acted as an agent of the international communist conspiracy. The association of Goldwater and the Society to help take both of them down, by 1968 Richard Nixon and needle threader extraordinaire have captured the president and Presidency and cemented an identification with the Conservatives, despite being loathed by Birch leadership for the lack of true belief. Nixon had flame famously withheld his applause when Goldwater declared at the 1964 convention that extremism in the defence of liberty is no vice. Two years before that, he had been badly bruised by the society during his failed run for go governorship of the California. Screeching Bircher resistance during the Republican, Republican primary had left him exhausted for the general election. After Nixon reached the White House, the dignified mainstream sufferings of the silent majority, not the rants of the Birchers, became the engine of his fainting, flexible conversation, which pivoted mostly autocaciously with decision to visit China. In 1972, no, no destination could have been more infuriating to the JBS. China, being where it epidemiologically idle, a 27-year-old American missionary turned military intelligence officer, met his death at the hands of Mao Zedong's Red Army on the August 25, 1945, becoming, in Welsh's estimation, the first casualty of the Cold War. Welsh did not discover Birch's story until 1953 in his brief book, The Life of John Birch. Published, he describes how all alone in a committee room of Senate office building in Washington, I was reading the dry typewritten pages of an unpublished report of an almost forgotten congressional committee hearing. Suddenly I was brought up sharp by a quotation of some words of an army captain had spoken on the day of his death eight years before. Welch tells his readers it is no accident that neither he nor they heard of Birch until years after his death. 
Never mind that Welsh's own awareness, however deferred, came from reading the official transcript of a legislative hearing. In Before the Storm, Pelston describes Welsh as a very curious combination of arrogance and innocence, and Terry Lutens, Birch's most recent biographer, believes the founder may have envied Birch's religious certainty and see in him the heroic figure that he always wanted to be, something beyond a prosperous executive in his brother's candy business. The James O. Welsh Company most distinguishing product was a pom-pom, my nickel-a-box confectionery preference during the years of the Goldswater Ascendancy. The stubble subtitle of Welsh's book, In the Story of One American Boy, the ordeal of his age reveals an author who can't wait to be off to the races, and by the second page of his foreword, Welch is celebratory. Even the pu- purity of character and nobility of purpose of the John Birch can atone for only a small part of such human vileness. But there is a strong encouragement in finding so firm an ente- entity entry on the credit side. D.J. Malloy in the World of John Birch Society, published in 2014, shows how Welsh's anti-New Deal's views, extraordinary enough in businesses, contained an embryonic radicalism that expanded during the early years of the Cold War. He described Welsh's beliefs that both his great political heroes Robert Taft and James McCarthy had been betrayed at crucial points in their careers by the Republican political establishment, an entity that remains a given for both the far-right Republicans and mainstream journalists. It is It has no clear counterpart in the Democrat Party, and even in periods of insurgencies, Eugene McCarthy's candidacy says, or George McGovern's, is rarely imagined to the opening by directives whispered from a, on a high. Taft's defeat by Eisenhower, Bad Vanguard Convention, was especially embittering to Welsh, providing one of the principal launching pads for his career in conspiracism, adding to the Molloy. Two years later, in The Life of John Birch, Welsh argued that suppression of the truth about Birch's killing was a minor chore for the communist conspiracy within the American government. For full understanding of that, please, Welsh directed his readers to go back further past urgings by Dean Ashson and Henry McGothrow Morgan. So, in 1933, the U.S. recognized the USSR past the prior radicalization of the American labor unions, even past the social welfare experimentations of Bismarck's Germany, which resulted in more minute controls over the lives of its subjects than had been seen since the time of Constantine. As the years went on, Welsh became lengthy, fi- lengthy t- fixated on the illumination of the 18th century, but in 1954, the immediate aim of his lives of the St. Parrot's love for his parents amounted f- thus almost to revenge, reverence. Sorry, love for his parents that amounted almost to reverence. His deep and glowing affliction for his brothers and sisters was to make John Birch into the first Bircher. The conditional perfect tense provided much help. He would never have been willing to accept peace, even for a short time, when purchased by a tolerance of such evils as he would have soon have seen the communists spreading across China and the world. Most treatments of Birch's life have tended to present it as a short preference or to the history of society carrying his name. But now in the John Birch of a life, Oxford, Terry Lutz resu- reverse, reverses the usual palpitations and presents a biography of Birch in which the society figures as sort of an epilogue. Lortz is the kind of credentials, a trustee of the Harvard Lansing Institute, a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, guaranteed to give fits to any Bircher past or present, but his book is through judicious and except for a few overdone academic references to Cold War paranoia, respectful of larger historical realities, 
Even conservatives near the mainstream right bank would be hard-pressed to see it as another anti-anti-communist undertaking. John went, John Birch went to China in 1940, not to fight the communists, but to create Christians. He was born in India in 1918, during the overseas missionary service of his parents, a three-year period that ended in frustration and disappointment for Ethel and George Birch, whose end of Evangelical zone zeal conflicted with more marital progress, material progress being persuaded, pursued by the missionary Sam Higginbottom, their boss at the Olabad Agriculture Institute. Birch grew up with six siblings in New Jersey and Georgia, absorbing the fundamentalist outlook of parents ever more opposed to liberal American Protestant, and entered Merson. Mercer University in Macon, Georgia, in 1935. Slim and attractive, he was also, according to Lutz, an ornate, passionate, and headstrong. The most notable stateside episode of this brief life involved participating in a 13-member student group against five professors whose theological views they deemed hereditary. Cool. The accusing students were decided morality on the Baptist campus and charges against the faculty were dismissed after a 10-hour hearing. Birch went on to graduate at the top of his class, but found himself shunned by a portion of his members. He began, sorry, he began to feel that he had been used, provoked into a fight by some of Macron's towny Baptist ministers. Lutz rejects arguments that he was temperamental extremist of the Robert Welsh sort and some signs of a greater maturity and forbiddance in the Welsh's postgraduate years support this view. Though it's worth noting that Welsh, in his own biography of Birch, says that Mercer episode, in the ardent certainty and forever of his own early faith, he had been guilty of intolerance, or what might be construed by many people. This is a mouthful coming from the founder. Birch followed Mercer with a year of study at Fort Worth Bible Institute run by J. Frank Norris, a fundamental radius preacher. Seeing a great potential in Birch, Norris kept track of it, the evangelist after pointing him to Sweet Baptist Mission in Hangzhou, China. When he arrived in September 1940, after a year of the country, they were at war with Japan. Birch moved to Sampur in Sangu, about 200 miles away. In time, he became skilled blend Mandarin and also a tamer that likely reflected not only professionalism but also respect for the Chinese that exceeded the norm proselytizers. This is evident from Virtus Georgia youth that he recognizes his own racial prejudice and struggles to overcome it. Virtus' love of China and his oft expression intention to stay there eventually dis- used his mum from making efforts to repatriate repatriate his body. By April 1942, Birch had become discouraged by illness, hunger and missionary bureaucrats far from the scene. He wrote a letter volunteering for the service, preferably as a chaplain, with the American Missionary Mission to China. Before getting a reply, he fortuitously encountered some of Jimmy Doolittle raiders who had landed a plane near Seoul after the famous air raid on Tokyo. They saw a gaunt western man with several days' growth of beard, lots of rights. And one of the airmen explained, Well, Jesus Christ, the missionary replied. That's an awfully good name, but I'm not here. <laughs> Birch began playing what his biographer calls a useful but limited role in assisting the two little raiders, aid that would later be puffed up by J. Frank Norris and finally by Welsh, and went on to serve as the eyes of the 14th Air Force, the Flying Tigers, led by General Claire Lee Shanelot. He retained his ambition to do evangelical work in Tibet. Once the war ended, but by middle 1945, he was depleted by malaria, physically and mentally exhausted. When he received a final military assignment in August, but 
just after the Japanese surrender was announced and at the beginning of a renowned conflict between the two Chinese nationalists and communist forces, he was, let's write, showing signs of paranoia and post-traumatic stress disorder. The latest mission involves searching for documents left behind the Japanese in Jiangsu province and asserting the state of local railways and roads. Birch's party ran into a group of Red Army soldiers. The Americans were told to disarm. Birch became angry and insulting. Things quickly escalated and he was shot. Immediately afterwards, at least one of the communist soldiers mutilated his face beyond recognition with a bayonet or a knife, Mel Zanel replied. For the killing to the general, American General Albert Wendemeyer, but came away from their meeting feeling incensed and humiliated by Windermeyer's insistence on being able to send American troops anywhere in China without necessarily informing the Chinese beforehand. Lutz conscientiously presents the killing as a frog of war incident in which Birch's frustration and exhaustion may impair his judgment. Still, if the author's even hand Handed effort shows more respect to John Birch than an ideological matterological that followed. It is remarkable that he finds it necessary to note how all the damage done by the likes of McCarthy and Welsh paled by comparison with the massive ideological witch hunts in China under Mao. The inclusion of this widely self-evident stipulation, sort of bland, unconscious concession, some say it, say something in a small way about the long standing preservation about the long standing perseverance of the American anti anti communism, a quiescent orthodoxy that drove some conservatives to extremes. There was indeed something slipshod if not sinister, about the initial reports of Birch's death. Ethel Birch was told, first told that her son had been killed by stray bullets. Sturdier information came her way later, but requests for a full accounting from the Pentagon and the OSS left her convinced of a whitewashed and even susceptible to the theory that his own government had ordered them his murder. She gave Welsh her permission to use John Birch's name for the society, but she hoped to see her son accorded as a religious rather than a political martyrdom. Headquarters in Belmont, Massachusetts, near Harvard and Welsh, the Welsh Candy Company. The society's membership peaked in the early to mid-1960s at between 60,000 and 100,000, instructed by the JBS Blue Book and kept up to date by its magazine, American Opinion. Members participated during this organization's first decade in those efforts to cancel U.S.-Soviet summits, impeach Chief Justice Warren, circulating petitions, conducting letter-writing campaigns, and screening informational film strips. But the Birch leadership fought its deadliest battles against the non-rogue elements of the conservative movement, trying to thread the same needle as Goldwater, William F. Buckley, Jr., a national review show Welsh the Conservative Door in 1962. Three years later, the magazine shut it on the whole society. D.J. Malloy sees the Birches as having played a crucial role in the conservatism rival because of these internecine smackdowns. The society helped by providing something for more respectable conservatives to define themselves against and differentiate themselves from. This seems a stretch the more that the mainstream conservatives downplay the Birch's influences, the more effectively liberal minded media and p politicians tend to overestimate it, and to condemn moderate conservatives for insufficiently distancing themselves from the society, what Malloy calls the society uncanny the ability to draw attention to itself and its causes and its activities can be better attributed to the Birch's liberal opponents than to themselves. Conservatives, both mainstream and fringe, were surrounded by what Malloy 
Pilstone, and the others see as much larger civic consensus. E.J. Dion, E.J. Dion, in his new book, Why the Right Went Wrong, Conservatism from Goldwater to the Tea Party and Beyond, Simon and Shelster, recalls the conservative strategist Richard Vogueries explaining to him how to direct mailing fundraising, which came of age in the Goldwater campaign, created lines of communication among the conservatives unimpended by mainstream media. If moderates and liberals don't feel simply impeded, it's because by and large they weren't. The aggrieved sense of being divorced from the nation's ethos helped to push some conservatives beyond the pale into exhilarating battle and fellowship that the Birch Society, operating locally in Kaffelschketch size chapters, seemed to offer. Claire Connor, enwrapped in the flag of personal history of America's radical right, 2013, tells of growing up in Chicago during the 50s and 60s after the John Birch Society became my parents' lifelong obsession. Her father, Jay, she says, spent 32 years on the Society's National Council. Connor's member has its affecting moments, but much of its dialogue is recalled with kind of a camera-ready convenience meant to penetrate the thickest skull. Suddenly, the goddamn liberal press had smeared us again. He ragged on about extremism, loyalty and conspiracies. We are patriots, he screamed. Do you hear me? We are the patriots. J. Connor particularly admired Fred Koch, a Bircher businessman who travels to the Soviet Union during the 1930s, endangered and angered, a hatred of communism and organized labor. Claire Connor's treatment of Koch's finest, now famous sons, Charles and David, devotes no attention to how they moved away from their father's more alto positions, so she tends to ring a sort of conspiracy bells her parents once in, as when she describes the funding of President George W. Bush inaugural balls in 2001, much later, really. America learned that a lot of the cash had come from big corporations that did business or wanted to do business with the federal government. Connor is routine, twin- Connor is routinely, routinely confounded by revelations of the nefarious, but when she learns in 2007 that the FBI had investigated the John Birch Society as part of its subversive Trends of Current Interest program, she expressed none other than the alarm that typical greets the discovery of similar Cold War surveillance of the left. The former sort can be presented, even in the Birch histories, less personal than hers, as pardonable or consoling. Malloy may seem to have reservations about how Governor Pat Brown had California's Attorney General investigate the society's activities in 1961, but when Pearlstein asserts that President Kennedy ordered an aide to begin preparing monthly reports on the right and asked the Director of Audits at the IRS to gather intelligence on organizations receiving tax exempts. He doesn't break into a new paragraph, let alone sweat. The most interesting facet of Connor's unfortunate youth involves her having been a student of the University of Dallas and a witness to the presidential motorcade on the November 22nd. 1963. Did the Birch Society have anything to do with this? She asked her father, just afterwards on the phone. He hung up without answering. Connor tells the reader, the gesture is meant to be read as furtiveness, not indignation. For 50 years, the judgment that the far right was at least indirectly guilty of Kennedy's killing has been a mainstream position. From William Manchester's The Death of a President in 1967 to Bill Minningo and Stephen L. Davis Dallas in 1963, 2013, the argument is made that a hateful climate created by extreme conservatives, particularly General Edward Walker, a Dallas resident and perhaps the most famous Bircher after Welch, somehow hastened the president's killing. It simply does not matter that Lee Harvey Wellswell, a defector to the Soviet Union, had espoused an ill-taughted form 
of Marxism from the time he was a te teenager or the seven months before the killing, Kennedy Oldsboro was with the same rifle shot at and nearly succeeded at killing Walker. In April, we're supposed to believe he was shooting at Haight. By November, he was shooting from it. J. Allen Boyles, in a book published in the year after Kennedy's death, the John Birch Society, Anatomy of a Protest, wrote, The assassination of President Kennedy brought home to all thoughtful people of our laxity in allowing the creation of an atmosphere in which assassination is not only possible but almost expected. Broyles makes the three references to General Walker in his slender volume, but none to Oswald's attempt on his life. Communism killed Kennedy remains one of the mu one of the few defendable statements that the John Birch Society ever issued. Of course, Welsh added his own evidence-free explanation of how Oswald received his orders from the American portion of the international communist conspiracy. In 1989, the John Birch Society moved its headquarters to Appleton, Wisconsin, the hometown of Senator Joseph McCartney, McCarthy, a fact usually mentioned with the just saying brevity in histories of the JBS reporting from time of the move, however, indicates that the choice of the new location derived from its proximity to the business enterprises of the society CEO at the time, G. Allen Bowlitz. The diminished society can also today be found on the web, its friendly homepage banner showing, when I clicked my way on it, it happily, ethically diverse group of young people, one of them literally wrapped in vague. Issues are highlighted by the website include energy supports for nuclear variety, immigration, a call for the enforcement of existing laws, and trade agreements, opposition to the Trans-Pacific Partnership. None of these positions are especially radically, but it only takes one minute to find a rabbit hole. 21. Seeks for the government to curtail your freedom. To travel as you please, own a gas-powered car, live in a suburb, or to raise a family, the fight is against... It's a charade to help build one of the most traveling access aspects of our nation's expanding refugee program appears to be the UN's role in it. One page on the site displays myth burst facts about the society and exercise that ends up striking a visitor as a less defensive than vestigial. Six of the nine myths, including how the JBS considers public water fluoridation part of the communist mind control plot, relate to controversies from the society's half-century-old heyday. Scholars and survivors of the society are frequently determined beyond what is warrantable by the facts to see the spectra of Birchism in any full-throated contemporary manifestation of conservatism. In 2008, with the election of and for financial crisis that paralleled the Great Depression, Claire Connor found herself as often stunned, this time by a realisation that the slumbering John Birch Society was about to be born again. In Why the Right Went Wrong, Dion quotes Columbia Professor Alan F. Weston's prediction from 1962. The future of the John Birch Society and the radical white right will be very largely be shaped by the way business conservatives and the Republic Party police the boundaries of their movement, and it updates with the observation that those boundaries were to become quite porous with the rise of the Tea Party. Even the level-headed Terry Lutz, in later describing Ted Cruz's September 2013 filibuster against the funding for Obamacare, declares that this effort to restrict government in the name of protecting individuals Freedom was entirely consistent with the, both the principles and tactics once advocated by Robert Welsh. Cruises off the deep end positions on a number of matters, including climate change, are amply and regularly on display. But how and exactly does the use of parliamentary procedure 
by an elected senator square with Welsh's pamphleteering fantasies about 25,000 traitors in our midst. All thoughtful people, Borland's phrase from that civic consensus, might ask themselves if they sometimes are guilty of erasing the boundaries that they would be, have responsible conservative police by exhibiting a tendency to see and speak of conservatism with a single fairly despicable continuity. Sorry for saying some of these words wrong. My eyes are sore. I haven't got my glasses on. And they're just straining. It's sore. Sorry. It was Goldwater who walked conservatives into a trap 50 years ago, embracing the word extremism without, in fact, being an extremist himself. The result was to make the term forever available as a kind of branding iron to be applied from left to right. These are deeply depressing times for moderate conservatives who are donating their time and money and shredded nerves to fending off the takeover of the Republican by far-right elements and the non-ideological egomania. As they do, so they nonetheless find themselves routinely adequate to the very forces which they are intramurally opposed. D.J. Malloy's book quotes Robert Welsh's old complaint that he was exercised with his compatriots on the theological battleground. The mainstream conservatives of the day were accorded by the left and the respect and privilege of a loyal op opposition. Today's temperature Clovis conservatives feel less secure in such status. He listens to his party being called crazy and accused of insanity in editorials by the nation's new newspaper of record. Finds himself tiptoeing through the watch your language world of the American University where free speech movement took off during the year of the Goldwater campaign and endures more and more instances of left wing trumpolite says sorry I can't say that such as the New York City Council recent proclamation honoring Ethel Rosenberg's one hundredth birthday clinging to neither guns nor religions and anything but blind to red state fevers, past and present. He wonders only if those on the other side of our ever more emotive and reflective politics can at least see him apart from the company he isn't even keep keeping. So that's just one of the one I'm looking at, and this was published January 11, 2016. So, who are these guys? Okay, let's have a quick look. Sorry about some of the words. Some of that advertising flickering just really, really hurt my eyes. I think this one is um pretty similar. Um, this one talks about how the GOP surrendered to extremism. Sixty years ago, many GOP leaders resisted radicals in their ranks. Now they're not even trying. Nelson Rockefeller and Barry Goldwater at the 1964 RNC. There's an image that still shocks in feral intensity. On the 14th of July, 1964, supporters of Barry Goldwater and the arch-conservative senator from Arizona whom the Republican Party was preparing to crown as the presidential nominee, unleashed a torrent of booze against New York Governor Nelson Rockefeller as he spoke at the party's national convention in San Francisco. So more than a century later, Goldwater's army of conservatives from Cookie Cutter, Sunbelt Subdivision, howling their discontent at Rockefeller, the embodiment of GOP centrists, East Coast establishment remains a milestone in the right's conquest of a party. The atmosphere is so heated that Jackie Robertson, who was a Rockefeller supporter, nearly got onto the fight with the floor with Goldwater Eltoy from Alabama. Now, this is Jackie Robinson. This is who he is. So now, no doubt that he was a Mason, no doubt. What is less remembered is why Rockefeller, 
who had lost the nomination to Goldwater, was standing behind the lectern for the first place to seek, speak in support of an amendment to the party platform that would condemn political extremism. The resolution repudiated the efforts of the irresponsible extreme organisations, including the Communist Party, the Ku Klux Klan and John Birch Society, a rapidly growing far-right grassroots, a group obsessed with the alleged communist infiltration of America. The resolution failed, which testifies to the GOP long-standing reluctance to draw a bright line against the extremists who congregate at its fringes. But the fact that such a resolution was debated at all is such a visible venue and such a high-profile advocate also say something about the Republicans today. I'm not going to get into that one. I'll leave that one in the link for you. So, what does Wikipedia say? All right. Wikipedia says the John Birch Society is an American political advocacy group. It describes itself as supporting anti and limited its critics and academics have called it a radical right or far right organization. Businessman and founder Robert Welsh Jr., 1899 to 1985, developed an organizational infrastructure of nationwide chapters in December 1958. After an early increase in membership and influence, efforts by the critics of the JBS book, such as conservative William F. Buckley Jr. and the National Review, pushed for the organization to be identified as a fringe element of the conservative movement, mostly out of fear for radicalization of the American right. More recently, Jet Hur has argued the New Republic that while the organization influence peaked in the 1970s, Birchism and its legacy or conspiracy theories have become the dominant strain in the conservative movement. Political has asserted that the JBS began a making a resurgence in the mid-2010s, and while the JBS has argued that the shape it shaped the modern conservative movement, especially the originally based in Belmont, Massachusetts, the society is now headquartered in Grand Chute, Wisconsin, a suburb of Appleton, Wisconsin. Local chapters throughout the United States, the organization owns the American Opinion Publishing, which publishes the magazine New American. So the JB Society S, uh, supports limited government, opposes wealth distribution, economic interventionism, opposes collectivism, totalitarianism, anchorism, and communism. It opposes socialism as well, which asserts it says fil is infiltrating U.S. government administration. In a 1983 edition of the political debate television program, Crossfire Congressman Larry McDonald, a conservative Democrat from Georgia, then the society's new appointed chairman, characterized it as belonging to the old right rather than the new right. The society opposes the, and it, its immigration, has even immigration reduction view on the immigration reform. It opposes the, the North American Free Trade Agreement, the Central America Free Trade Agreement, the Free Trade Area of Americas, and other free trade agreements. It argues that the U.S. Constitution has been devalued in favor of political and economic globalization, and that the alleged trend is not accidental. It has cited the existence of the former Security and Prosperity Partnership as evidence of a push towards the North American Union. JBS has been active in supporting the auditing of and aims to eventually dismantle the Federal Reserve System. JBS holds the U.S. Constitution's the ability to coin money, and it does not permit it to delegate its power or to transfer the dollar into a fiat currency not backed by gold and silver. And that's why when you see money written now, you see it like it's got an S like this, and it's got one line through the S, well, back in the old day when it was on the pound and then the silver, it used to have two lines through the, the S, and that meant that it was real. But doesn't that just sound a bit crazy that all of this seems to be happening today, doesn't it? 
And I want to say thank you if you're still with me. I appreciate your support. Thank you very much. Okay, the origins. I think I've read this a few times. Um, during an in, established in Indianapolis, in Indiana, during a two day session on December 8 and 9 in 1958 by a group of 12 led by Robert W. L. Welsh Jr., tired candy manufacturer and a conservative political analyst from Belmont, Massachusetts. In 1954, Welsh authored first book about John Birch, titled The Life of John Birch. He organised anti-communist society and to break less, more responsibility in a better word. He named his new organisation in memory of Birch, saying that Birch was an unknown but dedicated anti-communist and the first American casualty of the Cold War. Jimmy Lou Doolittle was a famous American pilot who met Birch in China during World War II, said in his autobiography in 1994 that Birch certainly would not have approved of that particular loose of his name. So Birch was an American Baptist missionary in China since 1940 during World War II. He was a U.S. military intelligence officer under Brigadier General Claire Shelnow in China. He commanded the Flying Tigers of the U.S. Army Air Forces units in China. April 1942, Birch helped Lieutenant Colonel Doolittle and his flight crew and other crews a few days after they bailed out of their B-52 bomber over Japanese-held territory in China. 16 B-52s led by Doolittle bombed Tokyo. Doolittle Road raid off the Navy craft carrier USS Hornet during the United States' first attack on Japan. Beginning in July 42, Birch, who spoke Chinese, became an Army intelligence officer. He operated alone or with nationalist Chinese soldiers and regularly risked his life. Japanese held territory in China. His many activities included setting up Chinese agents and radio net intelligence networks and rescuing drowned American pilots. He had two emergency aircraft railways built. Even though he suffered from malaria, he refused furlongs. Get us here a bit. Birch was promoted captain in China for and with the OSS, the U-Time Wartime Intelligence Service, in World War II. In August, after the Japanese surrendered, Birch was ordered by the OSS to northern China to give surrender of the Japanese condoms at their installations. On the 24th of August, nine days after the war, Birch left by train with his party, which included two American soldiers, five Chinese officials, officers, two Koreans who spoke Japanese. After spending a night in the village, the party proceeded by a hand car the next morning, ran into a group of 300 armed Chinese communists. Birch and his Chinese officer aide approached them and were told to surrender their weapons and the group's equipment. Birch refused and, after arguing about it with the commander, they were allowed to proceed along the way Birch's party encountered more groups of communists. The parties arrived at a train store at Hao Kang, which was occupied by more Chinese communists. Birch requested to speak with their leader. Birch and his aide approached the group's leader after Birch refused to give up his sidearm. Both were beaten and shot. Birch's corpse was bayoneted. The rest of Birch's party were taken prisoner. Birch's aide survived and the prisoners were later released. Birch's remains were recovered and a Catholic bevis was held with military honours on the hillside of Shenzhou in eastern China. The Chinese communists who were active in northern China and Manchuria were supposedly World War II allies with the United States. However, they barely opposed Japanese ever since Japanese invaded China in 1937. Birch believed that Mao Zedong and the Chinese communists intended to take over China after the war as they did in 1949, and move into Korea. The founding members of the JBS included Harry Lynn Bradley, co-founder of the Allen Bradley Company, 
and Lynn and Harry Bradley Foundation. See, they put it into a foundation as a tax thing. And I just launder the money. Fred C. Kosh, founder of Kosh Industries. And Robert Waring Stuttered. President of the William and Golden, a major industrial enterprise. Another is Revelo P. Oliver. The University of Anolia Persifer. He was later expelled from the society and helped found the National Alliance. Kosh became one of the organization's primary financial supporters. According to the investigative journalist Jane Meyer, Kosh's sons, David and Charles Kosh, were also members of the JBS, however, both left before the 1970s. So who was Robert Welsh? You may have eaten a sugar daddy's candy bar at one time, but did you know that the candy was invented by the John Birch Society's founder, Robert Welch, <laughs> 33 years before he created the JBS? They always got to throw that number in, don't they? After manufacturing candy, Welch saw a great need in enjoying leisure time, combating the evil forces that threaten our country, freedom and lives, and he did just that by forming an organisation that seeks men and women of good character humane conscience, religious ideals. America would be much different today without the influence of Robert Welsh. At an age where most people are still enjoying their retirement, Robert Welsh decided to forego life of leisure and create an organization to promote what he saw as ideals of Americanism in order to battle the overwhelming wave of communism he saw taking over the numerous countries. He had already seen communism probably prominent influence in America throughout his lifetime, while his dictators would have rather seen Robert Wells sit idly by in a rocking chair. He would have had none of it. He devoted the rest of his life from age 58 to help secure future generations the freedoms he had enjoyed, and to give them education tools that, we, that they would need to use to hold on to these freedoms. <laughs> Ah, he recognised and was fond of the saying, all we need to succeed is significant understanding. Based on this, JBS was founded as a member-based educational organisation designed to reach out to the thousands to educate them on the original intent of the Founding Fathers, getting back to the Constitution and why the United States was established as a republic and not a democracy. He had a knock he had a knack for boiling down complex ideas, thoughts and problems into easily understood stories and solutions. As a vigorous reader, learner and a man of high intellect, this came to him, naturally to him. A child prodigy, he entered high school at age 10, graduated near the top of his class two years later. He then entered the University of North Carolina and graduated in 1916, age 16. Next, in the midset of World War I, he began studies at the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis. Where World War I ended a couple of years later, he left the Naval Academy and dipped his creative toe in journalism. Becoming a syndicate columnist, a short time later he decided to take a merchant marine position. Unfortunately, Congress ended the program seven days before he was to leave. He then knew he had to find an occupation that would allow him to flourish well, at the same time permitting him to take time for his academic interests. In the fall of 1919, he enrolled in Harvard, School, Harvard Law School to learn the free enterprise system. By 1922, he had enough of the school and a Marxist professor and later Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankenfurter. He left Harvard and launched the Oxford Candy Company. In 1926, he invented the sugar daddy candy and sales skyrocketed. He left the company he worked so hard to build with after a dispute with the management and started again. Eventually, he ended up working for his brother, at the James O. Welsh Company from 1935 until he retired in 1956. Two years later, he founded the John Birch Society. He had an extreme sharp memory, which enabled him to recite poetry for hours that he had to read 50 years earlier. But the memory is, is very deep knowledge of all things historical, could also be a hindrance for well, he could hardly give a short answer to a question which tended to infuriate those in the media looking for quick sound bites. He guided JBS through its first three decades until his passing in 1985. There was such more to Robert Welsh than we can 
provide in the short account. To those who knew him and worked with him, Robert Welsh is truly fa fascinating and loving man. He wanted nothing more than to preserve freedom and future prosperity for later later generations. We invite you to learn more about him by reading the Blue Book and the Politician. So I'll leave this in the link for you. And this is their actual website. So if you're still with me, I certainly appreciate this. I had um, issues trying to do a live stream. Um, not sure. Um, I'll try again, but I don't want to hold everyone up. I think I might just do a premiere on this and um, try and work out something on the other laptop. It's just really frustrating. Everything seemed to work after I left StreamYard, and it's just frustrating. But anyway, wherever you are in the world, thank you for listening, and I hope you learned something about some of our paths that you may not have known and it's important because those who do not remember the past are destined to repeat the, the you know disasters that happened in the past in the future so let's not make that happen wherever you are in the world thanks for watching for its vibrations much love bye